Hey guys, John here from fly8mikealpha.com and today we're going to go ahead and take a look at a little bit of a tough topic here. We're going to look at an accident involving a Cirrus SR-20 airplane with three people on board and unfortunately it did not end well for any of the people on board that aircraft. So we're going to go ahead and look at the mistakes that were made on the part of the pilot, on the part of air traffic control, on all the external factors and while there's nothing we can do to fix this accident now, unfortunately those three people are no longer here with us, there are things we can do to learn from the mistakes that were made and be able to recognize those mistakes in ourselves and in others so that when we are pilot and command in our airplanes, we know when to assert our pilot and command authority and never allow something like this to happen to us or to anyone else. Now this entire accident case study is actually a complete course online at fly8mikealpha.com. You can log in, take that course for free. It's about a 15 to 20 minute course that'll give you a little bit more in-depth knowledge about what happened with this accident, a little bit more backstory. Let's go ahead and try to explain it to you here, the short version anyways. So on June 9th of 2016, a Cirrus SR-20 airplane took off from the University of Oklahoma airport in Norman, Oklahoma, and set out for about a 350 nautical mile cross-country flight all the way down to the Houston Hobby Airport. It was a nice day, pretty clear skies, and our pilot was a VFR rated private pilot so she had just gotten her private pilot's license about two years and a month ago, had logged 332 hours total time and about 250 hours pilot in command. So by no means was she an inexperienced pilot, maybe not an airline pilot, but certainly not inexperienced, certainly not a brand new pilot. And for the last two years to fly 300 hours, that's certainly not a rusty pilot either. Pretty competent, pretty should be pretty proficient in flying that airplane. And in fact, she had over 300 hours in that make and model. So by no means inexperienced here. This wasn't for lack of knowing how to fly the aircraft. She had proven that she knew how to fly the aircraft very well for over two years and over 300 flight hours. So how did a relatively routine flight, although flying into a busy airport, how did this turn out so badly? The visibility was 10 miles. The ceiling was broken at maybe 3,600 feet and the wind speed was 12 knots gusting to 16. Certainly well within her capabilities of safely operating the aircraft and landing the aircraft in those conditions. Now it's really important to note here that Dana, our pilot, was flying her husband Tony and her brother-in-law Jerry down to the Houston area to go see Tony and Jerry's sick father. He was receiving cancer treatment down there in Houston and so they were pretty intent on getting down there to go see him. So there definitely was some external pressures making her want to fly right into that airport rather than maybe a less busy airport. And aside from a long flight in, 350 miles, about three hours of flying, it was a pretty uneventful flight getting down to the Houston area into the Class B airspace and starting talking to approach. Let's go ahead now and look at what that first approach looked like. November uh, 5 to Golf, what did the approach tell you before? Proceed direct to the numbers for runway four. Direct to Hobby. Hobby four two five two golf. Maintain maximum four to the speed of stable and, and uh, proceed direct to the numbers. Uh, seven thirty seven is on a nine mile final. Following you with an eighty knot overtake. Three five two golf tower. Four two five two golf. Yeah, I got traffic behind you. Just uh, go around and uh, fly runway heading now. Uh, maintain VFR I'm to put you back in a downwind from a three five. Uh, the winds are zero nine or zero at one three gust one eight. Can you accept runway three five? We'll do go around and line up for runway three five downwind. Four five two go off. Fly runway heading for runway four for right now. We'll fly runway heading for four. Four five two go off. Now after seeing that first attempt there, that first approach. We can see that, yeah, she was getting into a little bit busy airspace, a lot of other airplanes around. So there's some threats popping up. ATC is telling her to go fast. And we can see from the data recorder on the airplane that once she configured a full flaps, she started to slow the airplane down to right around in the 80 to 90 knot range, which might be a little fast for an approach, but probably not fast enough to really make her fit in with all those other faster jets, those 737s doing 150 knots on final. The other important thing to note here is that not only does she get go around instructions, she also gets a lot of instructions about switching to a different runway, a lot of wind information, can you accept that runway, and a lot of stuff thrown at her all at once. Well, she's in a pretty busy phase of flight. You're doing a go around. You're managing your airspeed, managing your pitch, managing power, managing your flaps. That's a critical phase of flight for any pilot, not just an airline pilot flying a jet. So is it appropriate for ATC to issue her all those instructions at that given time? Not really. Are they used to dealing with little airplanes? Not really, not at that airport. Although these controllers are incredibly competent and very good controllers, 
They're really good at dealing with big jets. They're probably not very good at dealing with little airplanes like Dana's. It's important for us to recognize that all those instructions coming at us all at once while we're applying full power, pitching to go around, retracting flaps, and doing all these busy things on the airplane, that's not a good time to be listening to all those instructions. It's not a good time to be replying to those instructions either. And the best thing you can do is simply fly the airplane first, navigate the airplane where you hear them telling you to put it, and then communicate back with them and ask them to repeat if you need to. Well, there's nothing glaring after this first go around or after this first missed approach. Dana is forced to make two more go arounds after this. And I think after watching this entire video and taking the course, you'll agree with me that at this point, after the first go around, the most appropriate thing to do if you were in this situation flying the airplane would be to simply tell the tower you want to go back over to approach and be resequenced for the approach so you can make a nice stable approach to the runway. Maybe a different runway, but ask for vectors back to a different runway. Ask for a heading and an altitude, and that is simple. You can fly a heading and an altitude. You've been doing it since you had 15 hours in your logbook or even less as a private pilot student. You can handle that. The runway changes, the wind, all these other factors you can think about later on as you're being vectored back around for the approach. In the meantime, fly a heading, fly an altitude, go back over to approach, get away from the airport so that you can come back in and try again. Staying too close is going to put you in too tight, and we'll see exactly how that plays out over the second approach here. 37 on 5-mile final, this is runway 4, and you're going to be in front of him. 425 to golf, turning around for runway 35. Okay, 5 to golf, yeah, let's just uh, just enter the right downwind of runway 35. Right downwind 35, 425 to golf. 5 to golf, I'll call your right base now. Sure, 5 to golf. 737 at your uh, 2 o'clock and 3 miles at 900 feet inbound from report. Advise that traffic inside. I have traffic inside. 425 2 Golf. 2 Golf. Make a right base behind that traffic. Runway 35. Clear to land. You're going to be following them. They're going to be uh, landing crossing our new party arrival. We'll make a right base following them. 425 2 Golf for 35. Uh, Sirius 5 2 Golf. Make a turn left heading 30 degrees. Left heading 30 degrees, 452 Golf. 52 Golf, did you want to follow the 737 to runway 4? Yes, that would be great, 452 Golf. 452 Golf, Roger, follow the 737 and to runway 4, clear to land. So am I turning a right base now, 452 Golf? 452 Golf, Roger, just uh, maneuver back for the straight in. I don't know which way you're going now, so just turn back around to runway 35. Turning to 3-5. I'm so sorry for the confusion. 4-2-5 to golf. That's okay. We'll get it. Tower team is 3 5 0 golf Alpha. Visual from like 4 4 minutes. You got 50 cents for us. 3 5 0 golf Alpha. I'll be tower. Roger. Continue. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. 5 2 golf. Uh, just make it uh, so you're in a right turn. Keep it tight. I need you to make it tight. Keeping turn tight. 4 2 5 2 golf. 0 golf Alpha. Traffic alert. Heading to your right in 1 mile 900 feet. 0 golf Alpha. Looking. Or 5-2 Golf, I need you to, okay, there you go, straight into runway 35, clear to land. Straight into 35, clear to land, and I don't believe I'm lined up for that. 4-2-5-2 Golf. Okay, 5-2 Golf, Roger, turn to the right and climb, maintain 1,600, right turn. 1,600, right turn, 4-2-5-2 Golf. 5-2 Golf, yes ma'am, heading about 0-4-0. Zero, 0-4-0, four, 4-2-5-2 zero. Zero, four, zero. Golf. Okay, 5-2 Golf, let's do this. Can you do a right turn back to join the straight into 3-5? Could you do it like that? Yes, right turn back to 3-5, 4-2-5, 2-Golf. 5-2 Golf, okay, so you're just going to make a right turn all the way around to runway 3-5, and now you're clear to land. 3-5, clear to land, 4-2-5, 2-Golf. Just 5-2 Golf, okay, you're looking good. Just continue a right turn uh, for runway 3-5. Do you see runway 3-5 still? Yes, 3-5, 4-2-5-2 Golf, have it in sight. Continue my roll around. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you're good, so you can start your descent to runway 3-5 there and uh, clear to land on 3-5. Clear to land 3-5, 4-2-5-2 Golf, thank you very much. No problems. Uh, winds are 1-0-0-1-0, zero, zero, zero. I'm sorry, winds are 1-0-0-1-5, zero, zero, gust to 2 zero. Number 52 Golf, uh, if you don't want to land, that's too high. We can put you back around on the downwind. Don't force it if you can't. Okay, we'll see. Thank you. 452 Golf. I think you're too high, Sears. Uh, 52 five, five, Golf, you might be too high. 
Okay, we'll go around then. 45 to go. Now that's a shortened version of what happened on the second approach. And if you want to see the full video, go ahead and check it out inside the course online at flyatmikealpha.com. But ultimately, what we can see here is ATC sending her all around in circles, her getting a little confused, which is going to happen to almost any pilot, no matter how experienced you are, with all those different runway changes, with all of the traffic callouts, with all those different confusing instructions. And now she's left higher and faster than she wants to be for the runway she's planning to land on and is forced to execute another go around. It's important to note here, though, that ATC isn't a bad guy for doing this. They're actually trying to help her. They're actually concerned for her safety right from the get-go and saying, hey, you look a little high, you look a little fast, maybe you should go around. She then later on agrees with them. It's important that you are the pilot in command, that you make those decisions, and you should recognize that right early on. Furthermore, you should have realized earlier on, before making all those circles and loops out there and, and making yourself dizzy flying in circles, that you need to speak up and tell ATC what you need. You need a heading, you need an altitude, you need to get boxed back around for the approach. You need to go back over to approach, get re-vectored, get re-sequenced. Whatever phraseology you want to use, they'll understand that. And they understand what you're asking for. And you tell them what you want and you accept nothing less. You are no less important. Dana, her husband, and her brother-in-law were no less important than any of those other pilots or passengers flying into Hobby that day. Flying in on Southwest, flying in on the King Air. Aircraft are handled by ATC in the order in which they are received. It's written in the ATC manual. Now, we know from experience of flying that obviously a little bit more priority is given to airliners, a little bit more priority is given to bigger jets. They're less maneuverable. They're burning a lot more fuel. They're a lot more expensive to operate. But that does not mean you are not important and does not mean that you cannot speak up when you need to and be sequenced in front of Southwest. Make Southwest do a go around. Make Southwest enter a holding pattern. Make the King Air go around. You are just as important. And guess what? Southwest has two pilots and tons of extra fuel to be able to handle all those situations. You may not in your Cessna or Cirrus or Piper. Now, before we look at the third approach, there's something I really want to drive home here. None of those air traffic controllers she spoke to that day wanted her to get hurt. In fact, they really truly care about her safety and her passenger safety. But they're doing their job, and they're doing it the way they know how. They've fallen into the same complacency that we do as pilots. And there's nothing lacking about Dana's skill here either as a pilot. She had flown for hundreds of hours, successfully, passed check rides, begun instrument training, and was moving along very well with her aviation career and her aviation goals. All it takes, however, though, to become the next smoking hole in the ground is a momentary lapse of judgment or a momentary lapse of skill or both. And unfortunately, that's what we're going to see here on the third approach. After the third go around, all of these small lapses in judgment on the part of many people involved here in a small lapse in skill to maintain proper airspeed, what you're going to see is that while flustered with lots of ATC instructions, frustrated with a third go around and a third missed approach, that Dana pitches the aircraft to a very high nose attitude. As the nose is pitching up to this attitude and she's beginning her left turn to follow ATC's instructions to get boxed back around for yet another approach, airspeed decays down to 58 knots, well below the recommended go around speed for a Cirrus SR-20 aircraft. And while airspeed is dangerously low, just above stall speed, she retracts flaps from full to half, and then from half all the way up. And as the flaps come all the way up, at an altitude of right around 600 feet, just after retracting the last notch of flaps, the aircraft stalls, begins to roll into a 70 degree left bank, full power is applied, and unfortunately, the correct inputs are never applied to stop the aircraft from entering into that incipient phase of the spin and developing into a full left turning nose down spin and the aircraft hitting the ground just a few seconds later. So it's five two golf Roger. Just uh okay, just you're just gonna make a right traffic now for runway three five. We'll come back around and we got it this time. Or five two golf, uh, make right down into runway three five. And you are clear to land. There'll be uh, no other traffic for my four, so this one will be easy. Three five clear to land. Trying to get down again for two five two dogs. No problem. Okay, uh, Cirrus uh, five two golf. Just go ahead and make the left turn now to enter the uh, downwind midfield downwind for only four. If you can, just keep me a nice low tight pattern. I'm going to have traffic four miles behind you, so I need you to just kind of keep it in tight if you could. 
And actually, I might end up sequencing you behind that traffic. It's on four miles a minute. Um, it is going to be a little bit tight with the uh, one behind it. So uh, when you get on that downwind, stay on the downwind. Advise me when you have that 737 in sight. We'll either do four or we might swing you around to three, five. But, uh, uh, ma'am, ma'am uh, straighten up, straighten up. We can see after this third approach here that ATC wanted to help her. They wanted to get her on the ground. Dana was also very set on landing at that airport, getting the airplane on the ground. Unfortunately, a lot of factors, environmental, along with ATC factors, and factors with our pilot Dana, led to the aircraft hitting the ground and everyone on board dying in that crash. In the NTSB's final report, they determined that the probable cause of this accident was the pilot's improper go-around procedure, not maintaining a safe airspeed when retracting flaps, exceeding the critical angle of attack that resulted in an accelerated stall, and contributing to the accident were the local controllers, the tower controllers' decision to keep the pilot in the traffic pattern in the second local controllers' issuance of an unnecessarily complex clearance during a critical phase of flight, the go-around. Also contributing to the accident was the pilot's lack of assertiveness, and the NTSB could not have hit the nail on the head any better than that. The NTSB identified that the pilot was attempting to comply with ATC instructions throughout the entire flight, and the pilot's actions were very understandable. However, that compliance with ATC instructions greatly increased the pilot's workload as it led to an extended period of close and maneuvering at a very busy Class B airport. During that extended period of maneuvering around that airport, the pilot did not assert the responsibilities that accompanying being a pilot in command and did not offload the workload by either requesting to be resequenced, telling the controller to stand by, or stating unable. This allowed for an increased likelihood of the operational distractions associated with air traffic control communications and affected the pilot's ability to focus on aircraft control. The biggest takeaway point here is that this can happen to anyone. She was not an inexperienced pilot, she was not a new pilot, and she had landed at Class Bravo airports before. This was not anything out of the realm of ordinary. This can happen to any of us that get into an airplane. It's important to recognize the key characteristics of what make this accident happen, the environmental factors, along with ATC and pilot factors. And to really do that, I would really strongly encourage you, go take the free course online at flyatmikealpha.com of this accident case study. Also, take the free course online at flyatmikealpha.com of the spin awareness course. Understand how spins happen, what scenarios they might happen in, and how to recover from spins, how to get yourself out of one and recover at the very first signs. Because at five to 600 feet, you don't have a whole lot of time to figure that out and to try to think back to the few moments of training you might have talked about spins with your private pilot instructor, you need to know how to do it right away, right off the top of your head. And better yet, after you do both of those courses online at the website, find an instructor, find an airplane and go up and do actual spin training at a good safe altitude and have them show you what spins look like, what the first signs of them are, and how to recover from one immediately before it ever develops. Thanks for watching this video, guys. Make sure you're always enhancing your skills, always studying, always improving as a pilot. Never let your guard down and always be willing to assert your pilot and command authority. You are ultimately responsible for ensuring that your aircraft, every time it leaves the ground, returns safely every single time every single flight you make. Fly safe, guys. We'll see you next time.